What up? The saltwater guys are in the house. Finally, finally, <laughs> we get to something that people want to actually see. Yeah, right. Can, I mean, folks, for people watching at home, I'm so sorry that you had to endure, what, 10, 11, 12, one, three hours yeah. of freshwater content just to get to what you really wanted to see. I mean, the, I, fair to say, right? Oh, yeah. The All-Stars are in the building. My name is Remy. I run the Bahama Lama Coral YouTube channel. And I am Peter, yeah, yeah. and uh, I run the Reef News Network podcast, and I am also the voice of Aquashella, so uh, even if you don't recognize me, you may recognize my voice if you've ever come to a show, because uh, I'm the one that says all the stuff. Yeah. I'm the one that's probably told you where the bathroom is, because that's, that's pretty <laughs> much the bulk of my job is, uh, do you know where the bathroom is? Yes, it's that way. Yep. Do yep. you know where food, that, today's been the big one, do you, do you know where I can get a drink or food? Yep. Down there, so <laughs> down there around the corner. Very important job. Uh, Very. We are here to talk about ten mistakes and myths in saltwater in the in the reefing hobby. Yes. And I kind of came up with some off the top of my head. Just I feel like we could start with the first one, which is, and I think this probably goes for freshwater as well. But just don't go too fast. Never. Nothing happens good fast in this hobby and yeah for there sure. was a comma in there so make sure there, <laughs> there was a comma between good and fast so nothing 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 good comma ever happens fast yeah facts it's a good indicator when your significant other is like hey when are you gonna put stuff in that tank you know after 30 days of <laughs> nothing going in your tank or whatever because you're cycling it or you're doing yeah. whatever but uh, that also goes for if you're going to start a dosing regimen mm -hmm. or trace elements or things like that. You want to have a good baseline, go slow, test, go slow, test, to make yep. sure that uh, make sure that you're good. And that also goes for like, it's super easy to spend a ton of money on coral and fish here and just <laughs> dump them all in your tank. And, and before and, you know and it, kill them all. Yeah, your Galaxia is killing all of your hundred and two hundred dollar acropora so that, that is it yeah. yeah you know so it is am i will say it is amplified in this hobby more than fresh water because fresh water you you know if, if you're some ph is out of whack or something you can adjust or you can do a water change on the fly without thinking much because you can you know kind of clean your water up with a, a conditioner or something salt water you definitely have to be more methodical you have to have salt water made if you need to do a water change so being reactionary in salt water is I don't know, kind of akin. There's this new term that's been going around in my company, and maybe this is a business term, but everybody keeps saying, well, we're building the plane while we're flying it. So, and, and I don't know, I guess it makes sense, yeah. but um, it's the same thing for this hobby. Like, you don't want to be building that plane while you're flying it. You want that plane built, stocked, staffed, and everything else yeah. before you leave the ground. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just looking for a headache. And, and if you, honestly, I'll say it, you tell me if I'm right or wrong. If you are not a patient person, this hobby is not for you. I, I would steer clear of it. Yeah. I'd stick with salt, uh, fresh water or something. If you do not have the patience to sit and wait and be methodical. Yeah, and honestly, most most things in this hobby grow slow. I mean, in slow. in the uh, grand scheme of things, you're looking at coral. Some grow faster than others, but even the fastest growers are still growing pretty slow. The fastest growers are the ones you really don't want because yeah. they they tend to be more nuisance stuff. But uh, but yeah, don't don't expect to. Don't see a, a tank on TV or at your local aquarium or something and uh, be like, oh, my God, I want I want my piece of the ocean and then go out and, you know, get all the stuff and then expect it to look like that. It takes it, – it either takes a ton of money yeah. or years and years of patience to get a tank to look like an actual, like, full reef if that's the look you're going for. Yeah. Uh, for number two, I have get yourself an RODI unit right off the bat. Number one purchase. I was not convinced of this when I when I set up my first saltwater tank, and I ended up just pulling the trigger anyway. I was like, "What's an extra two hundred bucks after all these thousands of dollars that I've spent?" <laughs> and I see these guys come into the, the local fish stores with these giant jugs, and I'm like, "Gosh, that must be a pain in the butt to have yes. to do a water change and go into your LFS to get water every single time." So, I, I agree with you there. Like, um, you know, water parameters from place to place are so wildly different that. Um, you can use conditioners. You can get by there. There are, are people that swear by tap water and have never had a problem, but that's the exception. Like, you're rolling the dice. And, and once you make the investment to get into this hobby, if you're passionate about this hobby, you're uh, you're going to totally end up falling in love with it. You're going to spend money on coral, fish, and everything else. The last thing 
you want to do is is take a shortcut that you don't need to like a, that's a two hundred dollar shortcut. Yeah. So why why bother? Yeah. Why why jeopardize two thousand dollars worth of fish and coral to just skip a two hundred dollar you know investment? And and it's easy enough to set up if you don't want to tap into your your pipes in your home you can always just hook it up to your shower head yep. or you know things like that and then it's nice because you got that RODI reservoir in your tub so when you overflow it because Which you, you will, will overflow it uh, it's just going down the drain that, that's I've, it. I've ruined many a floor doing that so our, our good friend uh, Metro Cat who if, if anybody's watching has listened to the podcast or, or knows Cat Cat lives in an apartment um, above a barn or not a Barnes and Noble a pottery barn or something one of those types yeah. of stores and three times she has overflowed, three times I know about, has overflowed her RODI unit in the apartment and actually flooded the store below. Wow. And I'm not talking like out of turn here. We've talked about it on the podcast, so I know I can say this publicly, but you don't want to be that person. <laughs> so not only do you spend the money on that, but take the second to think about where it's going to be. Because inevitably, unless you have like some sort of float valves or something to stop you are going to forget about it. You're going to get busy because it, it doesn't. It's slow. Like, yeah. I, I have a big, expensive Aqua FX unit. They're here today, like Cadillac of the units. And even at that, it's only 100 gallons a day. And you know, so some of you are with a five-gallon tank are like, well, okay, I can have water in five. Well, you know, when you're getting up into like my main display is 200 gallons, that's two days for yeah. me to make like you know that kind of water. So, um, so you turn it on and and you just kind of forget what you're doing. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> you go about your business. Even, even when you say, I, I've even set alarms, like, check the water, check the water still. You're like, okay, I'll check it in five minutes. And you forget, and then all of a sudden you're in bed at night, and you're like, did I turn off the RODI? So and I, you didn't. This this was not uh, one of those mistakes, but so I have I, you know I have my setup. I got a two 200-gallon tanks, and I have them set up to automate with float switches and stuff, all running through my Apex. Well, the Apex... I'm, you know, once it hits a low level, it starts filling up the, the storage tank and has a high-level sensor. My wife, the other day, I was on travel for uh, business, and uh, she said, uh, the basement's flooded. And I was like, all right, like, you know, it was kind of rainy or whatever. She's like, no, the basement is flooded. So she sends me some pictures, and I look. The solenoid that I have that turns things on or off must have stuck open. And the best I can figure looking at when the sensors went off and stuff is four to 500 gallons of water oh, wow. pumped out of the 100 gallon storage bin and flooded our basement so we actually have to have the we just made an insurance claim have to have the whole basement gutted i mean wow because half our basement's finished with carpet the other half is like a shop so it's uh and you're experienced and i'm experienced but <laughs> this goes to show too that i put too much faith in the automation and not enough in safety nets so there are water sensor alarms that could have, you know, I could have done stuff with or whatever, and I didn't bother to put those into place. So another big mistake that kind of goes along with this topic is don't don't think because you set something up to have a fail safe that that fail safe is safe. Like, yeah. Case in point, like the sensors did what they did, the solenoid stuck open and it just ran and ran and ran and ran. Not to mention, like, probably destroyed all my RODI media because it ran and ran and ran yeah. and ran. But um, but so there's another another tip to deal with is yeah redundancy is on is on the list for sure of making sure that you have backups for your backups in those situations especially uh not doing enough research mm. now i know that it's easy to and, and i know that pet coat and pet smart usually does a good job of this where it's uh they, they they interrogate you before they sell you one of their animals which is a good thing and which, which is, is i think should happen yep um but if you are walking into a reef store, hopefully you've got a good LFS that can educate you at the very least. And then you can go on YouTube and search like, you know, reef builders and tidal gardens and all these great, uh, great YouTube channels that are out there. My channel, I'm a very hobbyist centric yes. channel. So and, and just fun to watch. Well, thank you. I mean, absolutely entertaining. <laughs> it's it's fun for the whole family, honestly. Bring them all. It's uh, yeah, it's it's good, clean fun, good, clean family yeah. fun. Yeah, same thing with the podcast. I mean, we're out there and we're trying to keep the content, uh, you know, at all levels so you can consume it from a beginner to, uh, you know, all the way up to an advanced hobbyist. But there's no shortage of information, so do your research. But my caveat is make sure you do enough research to have a viable sampling 
because not everybody's right. There, yeah. there are some people that, that put out bad information with the conviction to die on the field with that information. And it's, it's wrong. It's provable wrong. It's absolutely wrong. So if you're only picking one source and you pick a random source, you might be picking a bad source. So it's always good when you're doing your research, pick a handful of sources, make sure you get a good comparison, yeah. and then run the averages. If, if four yeah. people are saying one thing and one person says the other, the one person's probably the odd man out. And uh, along with this, don't underestimate the value of joining your local fish club. Oh, my gosh, yeah. You know, not everybody has them. If you're lucky enough to have one in your area, I mean, the resources and the value, the information, the camaraderie, it's just amazing. That That is such an underappreciated resource in this hobby, I yeah. think. So. And you'll, you'll get some good friends that way. And also for things like when you go on vacation and you don't want to leave just a random next door neighbor to tend to your reef tanks which is very intimidating for not only friends but family members as well uh also a good thing to have maybe a local reef guy or even your lfs to come by while you're gone every other day or something absolutely and i'm fortunate enough that uh, i have good neighbors and uh, i don't know if they're watching or not but if they do a huge shout out because they take care of the tank when uh, when we're away yeah but i i legitimately made an instructional video like a feeding the tank where the food was i wrote everything out so while you can put somebody, do them the favor and don't put that stress on them. Yeah. Like take everybody's got a phone in their pocket with a video camera on it. Make a video of you feeding. Like it's it's so much easier to look at that as reference than looking at a list of notes. So so that's a takeaway. There's a mistake that uh, you might be making in this hobby is to to just say, oh yeah, you grab a pinch of this and drop it in. That doesn't really tell the whole story. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. Uh, number four on my list was test your water. Uh, and especially when you're first getting into the hobby, I know that this can, you can kind of let your reef tank tell you kind of what's going on as you get more experience and as you kind of know Listen what your me. corals will do. What? Uh, you can, yeah, they, they'll tell you what it's they need. I need alkalinity. I need calcium, please. Please supplement <laughs> me. But to get into a routine of testing, I always do this with number five, doing regular water changes. It's just a good routine to have. It's all part of the whole zen of motorcycle maintenance if you will zen of aquarium maintenance yeah zen of aquarium maintenance oh my god there it is our you, next book you idea author it, i'll manage the book tour <laughs> sounds good that's it that's the that's it <laughs> folks we're out of here we got money yeah. to go make uh, sorry uh, yeah um, yeah sorry folks next but. mistake is not going on that book idea that we just that's, had that's so the next mistake and that's copyrighted just so everybody knows <laughs> nobody can take that idea you heard it here first everybody down in the public so but now, Than is a lawyer. We'll, we'll get hit him that's on That's it. Yeah, get Than on that. We're going to lock it down right here, right now. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely don't underestimate. And, and if anybody watching this knows me, knows my history, knows my stance, I am a lazy reefer, low-maintenance kind of guy. I hate doing water changes. I hate doing stuff. But I'm also a total geek, so I, I've automated everything, which from my previous uh, story, turned out to be a bad thing with my RODI, but um, I'm a huge proponent. So when you're sitting and planning, and I think this comes to one of your other points, plan for the most that you can afford, even if it's more than you need at the time. Does that make sense to oh, that yeah. statement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even if you are looking at a piece of equipment that you know is not necessary now, it's probably gonna be wanted or needed six months down the road. Getting it, setting it up, and understanding it now is going to set you up for success down the road. You're going to be a lot better off having... It's just, you know, if you're a new reefer and then you add a piece of, like, techie equipment, that's another whole, like, overwhelming thing in amongst yeah. itself. So, so build out what you ultimately want and get as many of the frills as you can afford up front so you have a good handle on it and it works into your plan as opposed to I don't know, being like oh god my calcium's low I need to now get a calcium reactor and then you got to figure out how to learn and then there's the ups and downs and yeah. once you're reactionary to a problem in this industry it's too late it's it's not too late I mean that, that's harsh but um bad things happen fast Nothing good happens fast in this industry. Bad things happen in the blink of an eye. Yep. And the smaller the tank, the faster, faster it happens there. Yeah, I can still hear myself. I can't hear myself. Volume is kind of going up and down there. Uh, 
No, I totally, I totally agree with you. Some uh, like a good example of that would be like a protein skimmer. You're probably not going to need a skimmer for the first several months of the tank's life, but having it and knowing how it works and how it functions and all that kind of stuff is al is always good. And especially if it's like a, a smart protein skimmer where you got to pair it with your, mm -hmm. you know, pair it with something, whether it's your Apex or whether it's uh, just a, an app of its own. A lot of equipment comes with their own apps these days. So yep. Uh, yep. there's a learning curve there too. So uh, number six was ha feeling the need to buy everything new. Mm. I think that's a mistake. Mm. Big mistake. You can get a great size tank just a couple years old, maybe not even, because there's a lot of people that get into this hobby, six months later, they get right back out. And that tank is brand new pretty much. So instead of paying $2,000 for any Red Sea Reef or whatever, you're paying 1000 Exactly, I mean, there is no shortage whatsoever of secondhand equipment in this hobby that is next to new. Tanks are a great, great place. You have to do a little due diligence. Yeah. You, you need to make sure you understand what you're looking for so you can check out the seams of a tank or you, know, you don't want to buy something that's garbage. But with a, a little effort, you can quickly learn what to look for. And and yes, you can you can get twice as far in the hobby for half the money if you're willing to do the legwork. Facebook Marketplace, Reef to Reef, um, you know, their marketplace, they have a, their own marketplace over there with a ton of stuff. There's no shortage of places to connect with the community to buy used and secondhand goods, um, but you need to make sure that you at least do the homework to understand. Like skimmers are an interesting one. Like you can get great deals on skimmers, but that might just say, oh, it needs an impeller. And you're like, ah, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. But then you buy that skimmer, which was, let's say, a $300 skimmer. You buy it for 100 bucks, and you go home, and you find out the impeller is like $200. Yeah. And then you're like, well, <laughs> crap, I could have bought something with a warranty. So those kind of things are really important for you to do just an ounce of homework. And listen, you got a computer in your pocket. Everybody does. There's no reason you cannot uh, just quickly look something up. Same thing goes for when you're at a pet store. If you're at a local fish store and you question some advice that you're getting or you're trying to self-manage yourself, you know, look it up on your phone. Like, read, understand the requirements of what you're getting into for livestock or equipment or whatever. So. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, I also have not having some sort of livestock plan or some sort of uh, way that you want to go with your tank. And this, this could apply to a beginner or an advanced aquarist. Yep. Uh, for the beginners, I think, you know, you see those amazing fish, the angel fish of the world. And you're like, I really want an emperor angel fish in my tank. Well, you got to know that they're going to munch on your LPS. Yeah. Like, those are just things that you got to know. Are they reef safe? Are they not reef safe? Where do you want to go? Do you want to go softies LPS? Do you want to go SPS? You know, these are all different routes you can go with your tank. And I think knowing that up front will kind of allow you to pick a good tank size. Yep, great. And also a uh, good aquascape and all that down the road, so... Yeah, that's, you know, that's the thing, too, is that planning is important. Having an overall, I'm not going to say design aesthetic. I mean, that's important for aesthetics. But having an overall end game, I guess, I don't know, because certain fish need caves to hide or bury themselves in the sand, so they need deeper sand. Certain corals want to be high or low, you know. So you can't just look at these tanks and be like, oh, my God, that's amazing. I want all that stuff. And, yeah. and you start throwing rocks in a tank. You need to understand the needs of, of those fish, those corals, those things you want. Can they live in a community? Is a fish reef safe? Will it leave your coral alone? Uh, is a coral going to invade another coral so they need to be spaced out because coral warfare is another thing you need to consider. So not taking into account, and this is a bad mistake for beginners because they get so excited and they're like, they want like the uh, finding Nemo. You know, they're like, I want a, I want a Dory, and I want a Nemo, and, and a Morish Idol, and a blue tang. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> Morish Idol, amazing fish. One of the hardest fishes, fish, fishes, fishies, fishes, fish, fish. Yeah. Is there a plural? Is it just fish? I don't think it's fish because it's one species. Yeah. Anyways, they're the hardest <laughs> fish to to like keep alive in captivity in this, and you know, people are like, oh yeah, because you can find them at Petco. I mean, they occasionally come through and. I, I'm rarely have I met Petco employees that are going to dissuade you from buying something in the fish area, especially saltwater. Freshwater, they're usually really good, but saltwater is pretty specialized. So, yeah. you know, as a beginner, 
don't don't buy on eye appeal. There you go. That's a good one. An eye appeal? Don't buy on eye appeal. Don't be like, oh my god, that's a gorgeous fish. It's a gorgeous coral. I gotta have that. Yeah. Buy on understanding if it fits with your overall plan for the community you're building in your reef. Yeah. Number nine. Have a backup plan when your power goes out. <laughs> and this could be as easy as battery powered air stones. Yep. Yep. Just gotta keep that water moving. Moving and shaking. Uh, oxygenation, that kind of thing. However, if you live in an area, and I guess St. Louis is where I'm from, kind of does it. We just had a bunch of ice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Can take down power lines for multiple days. You're going to want some sort of generator or battery backup of some sort to keep the heat on if you're in a cold environment, to keep that water moving through the tank. And it's one of those purchases... It's a four or five hundred dollar generator. You don't want to buy it. Nope. But you're going to thank yourself if this happened to me last winter. Our power went out, and I was on the phone with my LFS owner, like, "Hey, do you have a generator? I can come get it now." Thankfully, the power went on about an hour later. But, gosh, you just start freaking out. It just starts. You, you go into that mental state, and you can prevent that from happening just by having a generator. And there's a bunch of them on Amazon you can oh, get yeah. for two or three hundred bucks. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the key is if you're going to go the generator route. Make sure you start it like at once every six months, you know, and, and do the maintenance stuff, keep the stable and the gas, turn the gas off, let it run dry. Having a piece of equipment is only as good as the maintenance you do to make sure that it runs when you need it. And um, if you don't use it often, making it part of your aquarium maintenance plan to start it every quarter or six months or whatever is just as important as the rest of the plan that, you know, you kind of have together. So it's, it's important. It's, you know everywhere now we're all, we're all technology based like every company facebook and uh you know uh, uh, netflix youtube like they have major disaster recovery plans like if something goes down they know exactly what when where and do it you don't obviously have to go to that extreme but having an actual plan like writing down the steps of what you need to do because if you do it once a year once every other year it's not going to just be right there yeah so write it down print it out laminate it have a sheet keep it in a bin with those air stones and everything else so when time comes you have an emergency bin with your instructions spare heaters extension cords whatever you need to do execute your plan yeah. but you have it in one place that you can grab and go when you need it instead of scrambling when you're already in a panic because the power's out or this you know it's a blizzard out or a hurricane or whatever instead of scrambling when there's a million other things going on Take out that one bin, step one, two, three, four, five, boom, yep. you're done. Just something to put you at ease because I don't think enough people think about when stuff goes sideways, how stressful it is. They're, they're just doing, they're like, oh, I got a beautiful tank. And, yep. you know, that one time power goes out for no good reason. They just don't know what to do. They're like spiraling or they don't even understand you need to do something. And, and in a reef tank, it's very important to get that oxygenation. So like, you know, Remy said, a battery-powered air stone is enough to keep life support going. It's at least doing the oxygenation. Um, at the very least, at a, the very a wooden spoon. <laughs> Honest to God, <laughs> to like... stir the water up I, a little bit every... I, I have been in a pinch where every 15 minutes, I would go and stir for five minutes. Yeah. And, and trust me, it sucked. It was the, the dumbest thing I've ever done, but I wasn't prepared, didn't have my plan in place, and, 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 and then I had to just stand there and stir. So make a plan, check it twice put your equipment together be ready to go yeah uh and i can only go back to that moment that i had where the power was off for probably four or five hours and that freak out moment that you have like you said have a, a tupperware bin of things that you use in that situation and i would also say have a generator or a backup battery or something where you can keep that life support system going do it this weekend. Make like a checklist this weekend or yeah. this week. Set some time aside to actually make that up. It's not fun, but it will save you in the long run. No, and I mean, if, if you've gone out of your way to create a maintenance plan, no excuse for why not to have like a disaster recovery plan. Yeah. Man, are people actually commenting? I see. Uh... Yeah, we have a lot of comments on white shirt guy and black shirt guy. <laughs> so I'm telling you, that everybody here is from the freshwater world. And they're like, Where's, who uh... are these two idiots? Where's George? Where's the farmer? Yeah. Where's, uh, where's he? Where's he? Where's the aquarium co-op at? <laughs> no, but I think you get. We had 
you know, we've got 25, 30 people watching, so thank you so much for, yeah, uh, hey. for coming along with us. I appreciate it. So. Um, that leads me into the last, the last mistake that I think people have in this hobby, and that is to stress out about it in any regard whatsoever. I mean, this is supposed to be our meditation. I was talking with, uh, I was talking with Steve uh, over at CJ. So zen. I was. I feel like the water change, the maintenance of it, you don't realize that you're actually in a meditative flow state when you're doing that Maybe stuff. Maybe you, you know are. What I mean? I'm not. You're I'm not. Well, why don't, don't do water why? changes? <laughs> well, okay. Sitting, I'll take it back. sitting I'll take in it back. a giant bean bag in front of my tank <laughs> is a meditative state that, for me. Yes. Still, enjoying what you've created and what nature has kind of afforded us to have in our home. Yes. Because especially for for me, I'm the most landlocked you can get in the middle of this country, Missouri and Illinois, right yeah, right there yeah. on the Mississippi River. And so Great seeing an ocean for me is not an everyday thing. No. You come here to Orlando where people who have grown up in Orlando are like, Walt Disney World sucks. But I've been here and I think Walt Disney World is the most magical place in the world. I was just here a month ago and it is. It was absolutely yeah. amazing. The, the new Star Wars stuff, oh my God. Yeah, the whole, Rise of the Resistance? Oh yeah. Mind blowing. Yeah, it's like, like a total level immersion. Experience. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. Uh, they just then they just came out with the the hotel, the oh, Star yeah, Wars yeah. Has hotel. That, yet? that oh, yeah. they're doing previews of that. So okay. yeah, if you guys don't care about salt water, we're gonna do our Disney bit in a minute here. So yeah. being we're in Orlando, yeah, so right. we're that's gonna... a, that's the, con the the other convention that's here. That's yeah, yeah. So when we're done talking here, we're gonna go talk about uh, tips and hacks for. Um, the uh, Disney uh, Speed Pass. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Genie Plus. Genie Plus, the whole thing. Yeah. We're big, big conversation. So follow us over there on our on our uh, other channel. So My favorite part, one of my favorite parts about uh, Aquashello or any Frag Swap or Reef of Palooza or whatever is like going to the convention and figuring out the other conventions that are also going on at the same <laughs> There's time. There's legitimately four others going on here at the same time. Was it the last Aquashello that we were at in Chicago where there was a, a dog grooming convention? Oh, the dog. The, those people partied. Yes. They, they were good. That was was a good convention uh, yeah and then uh oh the uh in uh, dallas there was like some vampire book convention or something i remember that it was upstairs and I, it was I, like some author or something i don't know who it was it, but there's, there's had a bunch of goth kids walking around and some it was weird ones time, out so. there and and the best part is is they'll stumble into here like yes. the dog groomers all came into you know into that show and and had a great time because there's so much to see here like We've talked about it regularly. If you guys are watching this, you must be you know, part of the kind of the Aquashella family and stuff. But even if you don't own any of these things, it is worth coming just to see these things. Yeah. Like, absolutely. Like, uh, the predatory uh, people are here with the great horned owl again. That's awesome. I can't wait to go hold the owl. The owl is so cool. And then they have a gator and a bunch of snakes. And uh, there's somebody here legitimately this time. And if you're planning on coming down over at... Um, Customcages.com has uh, has a skunk, a pet skunk, descented. Somebody's house pet, and I understand they make wonderful pets if you have them descented. But like, where else are you gonna go <laughs> and find lizards, fish, turtles, yeah. snakes, owls, skunks, and uh, all this other stuff, and just a, a wealth of knowledge, art, art. I just bought a huge piece, an amazing piece. Like, I'm, there's ready. You guys can't see this, but some corgis just walked by. Everything you want is here. Yeah. And, and the biggest mistake, I'm going to caveat all of those. I love it. The biggest mistake you can make is not to come to Aquashella. Yeah. Boom, right there. That's it. So if okay, you – That's it. Okay, can I unscrew this so I can drop it, please? <laughs> so that, but seriously, if, if you have the opportunity to go, if you're watching because you don't live in the Orlando area, we're going to be in uh, Chicago, going to be in Dallas, you can get to one. But even if you're not – you should make it a trip to go. It's a destination. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And they're always in places where you can round out the week with all kinds of crazy stuff to do, too. So Yeah, my wife and I, last year when we came here, we ended up at Walt Disney World for a couple days. Yeah. So just her and I, we went to a couple different parks, and you can always you know, make it a vacation if that uh, works out with your absolutely. schedule. If nothing else, local frag swaps are a good place to, to get started with your convention experience uh, yeah, absolutely and you, you definitely have some experience with that in fact you have videos basing yeah the first time you you put coral together went to a frag swap so be sure to get over there check out uh, remy's channel bahama llama corals over at uh, youtube uh reef news network anywhere you get your podcasts uh, we took a little uh, mental health break at the end of last year but we're getting back into the swing of things so coming back with all new content 
Um, and then other things coming. So anything else in the pipeline for you? Uh, for me, I got a new tank. Oh, that's right. And so the whole basement's going to be changing here soon. So we're going to do a little bit of a remodel and uh, set up this brand new tank. I'm trying to get down to one or two. Yeah, right. We'll see how that works out. It never works out. <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank you guys so much for joining us today. Obviously, the streams will continue uh, with all of your favorite freshwater people. I mean, not us, so not, you might as well us. log off now. But, uh, you know, <laughs> for the sake of I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here, for the other creators, uh, you know, just throw them a bone and hang around a while, yeah, all right? Yeah. You know, it'd be nice. It'd be nice for them. Make them feel good, so. I mean, we have such huge followings already that it's, you know, like whatever. But uh, the rest of these guys, eh, you know, just just toss them a bone. A couple people in the chat, maybe say hi or something. You know, yeah. that'd be big of you guys. Thank you so much for joining us on the stream today and uh, more streams to come.